So just a few uh, disclaimers before we begin um, to remind you that this clearly is not a private conversation and this being recorded and uh, ultimately will be made, made available to the public through the library. Um, we very much want this to be an enjoyable experience for you. Um, so if at any time it becomes less than enjoyable, we're into a line of questioning that uh, is uncomfortable, just let me know um, and we'll redirect. If you need to take a break, just let me know that as well. Um, my role in the conversation is actually to speak as little as possible and to let you talk and hear your story. Um, but rest assured that I am actively listening and engaged um, and may occasionally look at my notes. Um, but that's my role here. So today is Friday, January 13th, 2017. My name is Andy Reisinger, and I am interviewing Mike Raffoff here in the Department of Special Collections and Archives at Georgia State University as part of the Great Speckled Bird Oral History Project. And before we begin the actual uh, conversation, if I can just get your verbal confirmation that you're aware you're being recorded and you consent. Yes, I am aware and I consent. Yeah. So let's start... Um, at the very beginning, if you can describe um, when and where you were born. I was born on a farm outside of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I left home when I was 14, never looked back. Got to Atlanta when I was 20. And um, and what was the date of your birth? Uh, I, October the 12th, 1950. And can you talk a bit about your, your family's background and um, uh, what they were doing in Kentucky farming? Uh, my dad was a, a, a tomato farmer from Madison, Indiana. His family uh, had just been tomato farmers. My mother's family was from Benham, Harlan County, Kentucky. She was born and raised there. I think she got out right after she graduated high school. I think her family came to Louisville. Her father was a carpenter in Benham, and he got a, you know, this was during the Depression and all that. He got a job with the International Harvester, a big company in Louisville, Kentucky, as a payroll clerk. So he went from carpenter to payroll. Mm -hmm. But he got his family out of, you know, Benham, Harlan County was the center of the uh, uh, coal mining and the, and the union movement there. And yeah. it was very violent when she was in high school. There was a lot of violence in Benham, Harlan County. And how did your your folks meet? Um, you know, I am not sure. Um, I, I, they they, uh, they met in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, he after he got out of the army, uh, they met. He was in. Uh, uh, he was a drill sergeant in uh, in World War Two. So uh, they met sometime after he got out of the arm. And and what were your parents? So you said you you grew up on a farm. Was your your dad still farming? He did active? farming, and he worked at General Electric Company. He was a machine setup. After he got out of the army, they put him to some special school and made him a machine setup. So it was a technical job. He had to set up the machines whenever they. Um, uh, New machines, or when they change product. In other words, they made, I think he, they made a lot of different, you know, washing machines, air conditioners, things like that. So every time you change your model, you, you know, they had, back then they had so many models, he would have to go set up the machines. It's mm -hmm. not a maintenance job; it's actually setting up the machine. So that's what he did. And then, and then had the farm at, at home. Right. Right. How large of a farm? It was just 10 acres, but it, originally we had uh, like three chicken barns and we had a, a tomato patch and a strawberries on the, we, it was on a farm on a hillside, so it was very unusual. Instead of a tractor, you had a four-wheel drive Jeep with a three-point hitch. You know, the three-point hitch could do everything a tractor could do, mm -hmm. so that's what we used as our tractor because it was a very hilly. Mm -hmm. so. And your, your mother was... Was she at home? Oh, yeah, she had seven, we had seven kids. I had five sisters and one brother, so she stayed home until um, 
the youngest ones were in high school. Then she went back to work eventually. But while I was there, she I don't believe she ever worked. And when you said she went back to work, what, what sort of work was she She doing? ended up, I know when I was, I was gone, she worked in the, for the Jefferson County, Kentucky, that's where Louisville is, in the child support office. Mm. She was the director at the end. She was the director of that office. Um, so. And so there are seven children. Where are you in the birth order? I'm third. Okay. And just for the record, your your mother is Joe Cooper, yes, Ralph and your father's John, right. Could you talk a little bit about your your schooling and sort of coming uh, up? I, I I went to the when, when I I turned eighteen. I was in a bad situation, but I got bailed out by General Electric. General Electric hired me. It was the uh, second highest paying uh, company in the Louisville area. So about three months after I turned 18, I got hired. And so, you know, I was making very good money. You know, I was going to the University of Louisville. That's where I started my education and uh, supporting myself. And uh, I think I got hired in January of... I don't know, 68, 68 I guess, mm -hmm. probably was, I would have been 18, and uh, it could have been 69 though, and, um, and then they went on strike in November, <laughs> so that's how I ended up in Atlanta, uh, I had, you know, in, in Louisville, they're the biggest employer, 20,000 people at that time worked at that plant, and so there was no jobs, no part-time jobs, you got one quarter pay if you helped the union on the picket line which I did, you know, for a couple of weeks or so. But then I went to North Carolina to live with my sister. And then I went back to Louisville, but I missed getting back at GE because they have a 30-day window. After a strike, you have 30 days to reclaim your job. And they sent me letters and stuff, and I didn't keep up, and I missed the window. Mm. But I did get back to Louisville, I think, in July of 69 and went to work for a, a Philip Morris tobacco processing plant. They didn't make cigarettes there. They, they got the tobacco in out of the fields and it was dirty, nasty, chemically laden stuff. It was a horrible place, but they paid very well. Um, and it's interesting, I got, uh, my skin broke out everywhere. I was terrible. They tried to fire me, get rid of me, you know, force me to quit. They took, I was in the lab at the time. I worked in the lab. They put me on the loading dock thinking that would just, because you can't sleep, you're all broken out everywhere. And because of the chemicals. Right, right. You know, sometimes in the factory, the visibility is like 10 feet. And the rest is just chemicals and, you know, dust. Because you get in the tobacco right off the field. Like, Georgia was the worst tobacco. And it's so funny that I ended up in Georgia. Because they had the worst quality tobacco. It was just mm -hmm. dusty and nasty. And, but anyway, so... Um, I developed an allergy, and since I was not in school at the time, when I went back to Louisville, I was not in school, I got c called up, you know, in the draft thing. So I show up for my draft notice, and uh, I'm broken out everywhere. And since, I had signed up originally when I was 18, you have to fill, back then you had to fill out a form, and I signed up as a conscientious objector at the time. And so I showed up then for the, what do you call it, the, um, when they call you up, to take the physical, there's a word for that. But anyway, I got called up to take the physical. And of course, I walk in there and I'm just pitiful. You know, they could say I probably hadn't slept in days and I'm broken out everywhere. And they wanted to know if I brought a doctor's letter. And I said, you know, because I'd signed up as a conscious objector, obviously I'd be trying to beat it or something. And I said, no. And they said, well, what's wrong with you? And, you know, I laughed, which, they, which probably helped my case. And I, said, and I said, I don't know, but the doctor says I'm allergic to elastic. And, you know, that was, they sort of laughed, too. And I said, well, what do you think it is? And I said, well, I work in a tobacco processing plant. <laughs> I said, so will you give us permission to call your doctor? And I signed a permission slip. They called him up with me sitting right there. And the doctor told him allergic to elastic. That was his diagnosis. And so they immediately deferred me because you can't be in the Army 
you know, if you're allergic to elastic, because the underwear and everything. So it was a medical deferment. And they gave it to me right there. Uh, that's again, I'm, I guess I'm, that would have happened when I was 19. It, it, just to go to the, anyway, when I'm 24, 25, they get a letter in the mail saying, we did not process you correctly. You were signed up as a conscientious objector and we failed to process that. So we have to process that now. So they processed me, gave me conscientious objector status, but then told me that my real, I, I didn't change my classification because since uh, I was medically disqualified, that was a higher disqualification and that was my actual classification. And my secondary classification was conscientious objector. So anyway, that's... Well, the bureaucracy was on top of things. It took them <laughs> a couple of years. But. Can we actually go back to your to your primary primary and secondary school? I was gonna say, when I, I, uh, I left home at 14, and I don't have anything to say other than how I got to Atlanta. Okay. Um, and you, so you came to Atlanta? From the tobacco nine? processing plant, I knew that, I knew what was wrong. I knew I had to get out of there, I had to do something. And I had a girlfriend at the time, and we had devised this plan, let's, let's go to Atlanta, and, you know. She had a, she lined up a good job. I hadn't lined up anything, but that was you know I, I had such a good job. I had saved money. That was you know wasn't a big issue. So uh, uh, we decided to come to Atlanta, which didn't exactly work out. By the time we got here, we were separate. So, <laughs> but we both came, but separately. Mm -hmm. So I came to Atlanta, and, uh, and 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 came with the intention of going back to school. So I had it enrolled before I even came down here and was accepted and started in the uh, spring semester of 1970. I'm pretty sure about that. It was the second, back then, it was semester, I'm sorry, quarters. Back then it was quarter, so it was the second quarter which started in late March or early April of 1970. So I was down here in time to start the quarter. And then I started that summer. It so happened there, you know, this is a commuter school, or back then it was. Because you're coming to Georgia school. State. Well, we cut, Georgia State was known as a commuter school. Right, but that's the school you... Yeah, and so, for whatever reason, there was no staff available for the Georgia State signal. And somehow, somebody told them that I was a very good writer or something, and somebody called me, and I went in and interviewed them, and they made me the summer copy editor. <laughs> so, the copy editor. And so then, I, I think in the fall, it was changed to... I moved over to features editor, or anyway, I started writing instead of just copy editing. And so uh, then from there, you know, it was pretty conservative for me. I, I, I considered myself a liberal person back then, uh, you know, conscious objector and all that. So anyway, it was very conservative. So I, I, somehow I ended up over at the Bird and, you know, people talked to me and found out I was a copy editor and that was great to them. Oh, we got a copy editor. <laughs> well, so they put me to work, they editing copy at the Great Circle Bird and then Eventually, they found out I could write, and I started writing for the bird. Had you had writing or journalism experience before working at the Signal, or yeah, I had some. Yes, in in previous schooling, previous, at, previous or, schooling and jobs. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, had you written for any? Were there any underground or other sort of papers in Louisville? That you no, had? not until the, the Great Speckle Bird. That, that was my first. Uh, I did write some stories for The Signal, and again before that, but yeah. So. And can you say anything about your your political coming of age? You you clearly by eighteen had had at least enough of a, a conscience that you wanted to apply for conscientious objector status. Yeah. Well, I guess it's just the times. Louisville is actually a very liberal city. People don't realize it. It has a very good secondary uh, educational system, private and public. Uh, and the, the, uh, but the, the people of Louisville was a very liberal city in many respects, and it, it was reflected in the schools. I mean, that's about all I can say it was, you know, when I came here, I was shocked with the conservatism and it was a different, like I say, that's why I ended up at the Grace Vocal Bird. It's probably something I might not have done somewhere else, you know. Was there anything that you were 
reading in particular or listening to films that you had been seeing? Uh, no, I'm a, a that... lifetime uh, reader of uh, basically four magazines and even then. Uh, but I include the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, Consumer Reports, uh, Rolling Stone started I think in 69, and uh, National Geographic. I mean that's what I read when I was young and that's what I still read today. Mm. Um, in the in between, there were some other magazines I read, Mother Jones, Mother Earth, and probably uh, Ramparts, which was a liberal rag uh, mm -hmm. national magazine back then. So, but yeah, mostly reading. I would have to say that I got my political education from reading. Yeah. yeah. So didn't it didn't come from personal associations or socially. Probably came from reading, and primarily periodicals and newspapers. Just what I said. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Just those that I mentioned. So when you arrive in Atlanta in '69, um, can you talk about what we might call the sort of mood of the city? You you mentioned that you were surprised at the conservatism. Yeah. Um, this is you know, still, well, the height of anti-war movement, civil rights is still a huge topic. Well, I, I, I was always, yeah, I was, so, I was still fairly young, so I was always a little bit behind. By the time I got here, you know, the Great Circle Bird had already been founded in like 68, I guess, maybe 67, 68. So I was not part of that. Um, you know, I missed all the big demonstrations, anti-war in Atlanta. They, they were all over by then. There was a few, mostly civil rights demonstrations in Atlanta at the time. There were some of those. And I missed, of course, you know, the summers of the Allman Brothers, I think, were 68 and 69. That was a big deal. You always heard about that. But I got here in 70, and there was no 1970 Allman Brothers <laughs> where they played in Piedmont Park all summer in 68 and 69. Mm. So I missed that. So all that stuff I missed out on. So... Now, later on, I did work for the SCLC. After I left the Bird, I did work for the SCLC. It's the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the organization founded by Martin Luther King. But, of course, Martin Luther King was dead by the time I got around to working for the SCLC. Where was your first neighborhood or house that you settled in? when you? Uh, I was in a rooming house when I got here on... Um, um, Piedmont, mm -hmm. right uh, near 10th Street. I was in a room, you know, just one room in a rooming house. And then I was only there like two or three months. And uh, then I, uh, the, the first place I left was Home Park near Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. and I lived in, uh, rented uh, half a house there. And what were the the sort of compositions of those neighborhoods in terms of... Well, a lot of tech students lived there, rental housing. The Atlantic Steel was was still there, but I think it was closing up, phasing out, mm -hmm. or had it just closed. And so it was just uh, a lot, of, you know, that was there uh, overshadowing the neighborhood. Tech hadn't expanded into the neighborhood, but there was certainly, it seemed like half the housing in the neighborhood was, was rental housing to students. And I used to go over to Tech and use their library all the time and use their basketball courts. I'm a very enthusiastic uh, basketball player. And so we'd go over there and play ball with kids. Yeah, you know, I blended right in. I looked like, you know, one of them. So right. Nobody ever stopped me, questioned me, or, you know. So. And by the time I got working for the Great Circle Bird, I was living in uh, Candler Park, renting uh, a house in Candler Park part of a house in Kendler Park at the actual time, I think, uh, working for the Great Speckled Bird. What street were you on in Kendler? Kendler Street. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Kendler Street is uh, right there at the top of the hill above Little Five Points. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right there, right on the corner. It was right on the corner of Kendler and McClendon. Okay. Yep. The corner house. There. Just a big corner house there. And when you started at Georgia State, did you already have a declared major, or? I had changed majors so many times, uh, but I did finally get my uh, degree at Georgia State in political science. 
that's what I got in. But I had changed. I think I was in psychology at the University of Louisville. I think I was a psychology major. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so. and do you recall exactly how you made the the leap? Or an introduction to the great speckled bird? Was there a person in particular? And no, I just walked over there one day. I said, you know, I need to check this out. I mean, like I say, it was so conservative over here at Georgia State. You know, I just was looking for something else, you know. And I just walked in one night, like I said, I think I walked in and just started talking to people. And like I say, you know, as soon as they found out, hey, somebody's got copy editing experience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it just, you know, I fit right in. So, and again, I was. You know, that's what I did for, for a while, for a couple of months. And, and how <clears throat> do you recall how you how you learned about the bird? Was it street seller? Yeah, you a, could. They, they sold the bird around Georgia State. You know, you could. You could it was uh, it was available. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So. Do you recall who you who you met when you first? The first per- person I remember was Steve Wise, because mm-hmm. he was such he was a nice guy. And, yeah, I think he, he may have been a copy editor. And there was somebody named Lydia, I remember her. Uh, she was copy editing too. And then of course, Stephanie Coffin and Tom Coffin. And they would be next in line for the people that I remembered and worked with it just from the beginning. And what month do you think this is? Is this still 1970? Yeah, it's still 70. I would say it would be the late summer, or early fall. Okay, so really soon after you... Yeah, it wasn't long. Yeah. 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 Um, and so you, you started off as a copy editor. Right. Um, did you stay in that position for a, a long time? I, just a couple of months probably when I started writing. I think that what burst me, what the big push for me into writing and... Um, at Georgia State, somehow I, I was I knew somebody who was involved in a research project. This is how I got started, with and uh, somebody had sent a proposal to the city of Atlanta to crack down on slumlords, and somebody had compiled a list of slumlords and rated their dwellings. They had a rating system, and the names of compiling of all, and 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 it was a computer printout. And I got a hold of one. I got the computer printout. And so every year, the I was a journalism major when I first came to, I remember now, I was a journalism major when I first came to Georgia State. I switched to journalism from psychology. And so uh, every year they do this for this uh, beginner's course in journalism. They do, a, they do a real press conference with the students. And that year they invited Sam Massell, who was the mayor of Atlanta, to the press conference. And so, you know, I had the slumlord list uh, and I was at the Great Circle Bird, so I asked him a question about it. And of course, he says, you're a liar, there's no, he said this at the press conference, and he got mad, he said, you're a liar, there's no such thing. If you, and I said, well, I have, it, I have it right here, and what I had with me was a copy, of course. I wasn't stupid enough to, at that time, you know, copying was harder, and you, you didn't risk having a, a real list. What I had was an actual computer printout, hmm. not a copy. And he, he said, well, if you've got it, bring it to my office and we can discuss it there. And so I took him up on that. I had it. So I made a, I went someplace and made a copy because I didn't want to lose my list. So I go over to, the, again, I went as the Great Circle Bird and again at this press conference it was for the Georgia State journalism class. But I went over there for the Great Circle Bird, of course. So, and I had the list, the copy of the list with me. And uh, I actually got uh, all the way up to Marcel's office. I mean, and uh, and I didn't get to greet Mayor, but he saw me, <laughs> and he sent the goon out, and they took the list from me in the Mayor's office. They took it from me, and then some a goon. It was a white male security guy. He grabbed me by the arm, takes me down out. The mayor's office on the second floor of City Hall it takes me downstairs, and then it you know when you go out the with the front door of City Hall, the front doors of City Hall, there's some concrete steps, probably about eight, and he just pushed me down those steps. Now, I didn't get injured, you know, I didn't break any bones or anything. But then and and that, and so I wrote about it for the bird, and that's uh, so. 
So after that, I was local news writer. And then I served at two different terms as managing editor uh, later on. Uh, so, but I did local political writing. We, we had, there was interesting times because, you know, Maynard Jackson, the first black mayor, got elected during the period I was the local writer. And we had the school desegregation issue. You know, Atlanta schools never de really desegregated. They did what, what at the time was called the compromise plan. In other words, we don't do busing in Atlanta, and they didn't. And they bought their way out of busing, so one of the few big cities that had a large, such a large black population to avoid busing. But there was never a busing program to desegregate the schools in Atlanta. And they bought their way out of it. Um, and so uh, that's, and then the neighborhood issue was a big issue back then. You know, they were trying to build highways through downtown Atlanta. And so we covered that. And then, of course, the civil rights, local civil rights issues, I, I wrote about those. Can you speak a, a, a bit more in depth about any of these? The well, I guess the, the, the big thing at the time was uh, the mayor's race. Um, because, you know, Maynard Jackson was running. He was trying to be the first black mayor of Atlanta. And uh, it was a very interesting race. You know, at that time, the white power structure in Atlanta had controlled things pretty tightly. But they knew they couldn't. They couldn't hold power forever in a majority black city like Atlanta. And so all kinds of political shenanigans were going on, uh, you know, whether they could co-opt Maynard Jackson or whether they could beat him one more time, you know, beat him. Um, and, and so at the time, there was this whole thing about they thought they were going to put together a deal. Okay, we'll, we'll allow a black mayor, but we want uh, a white uh, they called him at the time the vice mayor. Mm. And uh, so they did a whole reorganization to the legislature to give the vice mayor, or they, they gave a new title to it. I don't, I don't remember what it was, but it, so whatever you call the, so they gave new power to the vice mayor, control over the city council, and all those other things they passed at the legislature, knowing that, well, we're probably going to have a black mayor, but maybe we can still control the city this way. So they did all that, and their candidate at the time was Wade Mitchell, who was uh, a, vi a vice chairman of uh, one of the big banks. It was, I don't, they, the banks have changed names. I don't want to go there because I don't want to misstate, mm -hmm. but he was, uh, he was the vice chairman of one of the big banks at the time, and the banks uh, were very uh, powerful back then. And so that was their candidate. And so... You know, the big issue is whether Maynard would be co-opted and whether he would go along with this deal to, to let him be mayor and this Wade Mitchell guy be the vice mayor. And so uh, White Fowler stepped in. He put his ring, ha ha hat in the ring for, for uh, vice mayor. He ended up later to be a liberal senator, you know, from Georgia. Mm -hmm. But he got his start that way. And then Jose Williams, who I later worked for, in the SCLC, he got in there and in the race for vice mayor. And his whole purpose was to bust the deal. He didn't want the deal. He didn't want a black person to get elected by making a deal with the white power structure. He knew that Atlanta could and would elect a black mayor without a deal, that, that, that we, we wouldn't have to give up or share power just, you know, just for the sake of... So he fought that. and. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, I was covering all that, and, we were, and it was all out in the open. We put it out in the open, you know. We don't want the deal either. I mean, that was a, the left sort of take on that, too. We don't want it. And so uh, Maynard stayed away from him, and he looked to be, you know, I can win this. I don't need to do it. And then about a week before the election, it was probably a little less, uh, back then they had a ticket. A ticket would come out. A ticket is what they distribute in the black community by black leaders to let them know who we're going to vote for. And that's always the way it's been done in Atlanta. You get your ticket usually from your minister. And the ministers will distribute them at the Sunday church and whatever. And so the ticket came out. And of course, it was Maynard Jackson Wade Mitchell. And so we all hit the roof. <laughs> you know, so here I am. And, and see, the Grace Uncle Bird had a lot of power. Locally, it's because the Atlanta Journal Constitution had a terrible reputation, just terrible. 
back then. And um, so we, we had a lot of pull. A terrible reputation for? For fairness, they're being racist, supporting uh, the racist regime. Of the police chief at the time was terribly racist, John Inman and Sam Massell. Sam Massell was probably not a real racist, but he went down that route so he could be reelected. Now, you know, again, he, I don't, I don't think Sam Massell was really a, a bad racist, but he was willing to go there if that's when he get him reelected. So he was, again, he was the incumbent mayor in his first term. Maynard Jackson's running against him when he's running for his second term. So, so that came out. So I remember, you know, I even, I, so I'm on the phone talking to Maynard Jackson a week before the election, and he, I said, come on, Maynard. I, you know, the ticket's out now, so you're going to say you're not part of this? And he, and he told me, I promise you, Mike, I promise you, I had nothing to do with this. I know it's come out. And uh, so he promised me personally that he did not make that deal. And it, it turned out that it, he, he was probably telling the truth. Now, as much as you think of politicians and what he might do to get elected, he probably did tell the truth. But anyway, so again, when election day comes, they blow up the deal. We did blow up the deal. Wade Mitchell did not get elected. Jose Williams did not get Jose, he, Jose Williams got in a runoff with White Fowler on election day. Wade Mitchell finished third. So he's not even in the runoff. Maynard wins outright. Okay? Maynard wins it. So then there's a runoff for the vice mayor between Jose Williams and White Fowler. White Fowler wins. That's how his career was born. Mm. So we were all fairly happy, you know, Wade Mitchell got defeated, we didn't want to, and, and so we, we busted the deal, we felt, and we felt, felt powerful, so, because we exposed it and busted it, so, anyway. So, it, it's interesting, I, mean, I, don't, I guess one thing I'd like to say, just like, because, you know, I like Maynard, you know, and he was a good mayor, actually, and he was good because he knew, uh, he knew how to address racism and correct the evils of the past. He knew, as mayor, his main thing was economic. He opened up this city for black middle class and for black businessmen, black jobs. He did that in a big way. And so, uh, anyway, he did, on uh, election night, he actually had one of his people call me and said, Maynard, you know, wants to give you an interview. And so, on election night, he calls me up. And, of course, everybody's just you know, partying and everything, but he let, I sat beside him for a couple of hours, but I didn't, we didn't really do anything, because he was dog tired, and uh, what was the other mood he was in? He was tired, and, uh, no, nah, I can't, I'm fishing, can't remember now what, uh, uh, he was, he was humbled, I guess, by the whole thing, you know, because it had been such a tough fight. I guess they had a little disbelief, humbling disbelief, like, you know, I did it, you know, because, you know, you have doubts. You, you're the first black mayor of Atlanta. He knew what a tough, how tough it was. Um, um, you know, there was a big fight with the police chief at the time and, and, and all the racism that had been stirred up over that election. But, um, so. Did you continue to have, to have his, to have access to the mayor's office? Sort of for a while. I think that uh, that, uh, that faded away pretty quickly because, you know, we were just as, you know, we were going to be critical of him. You know, the issues on uh, the highways coming through the neighborhoods and the other issues. Uh, and, and I guess maybe he didn't see that coming, that we weren't going to be his friend uh, on some of these issues. So, you know, I guess that, they did no. It didn't. There was not a good relationship that developed out of that. Mm -hmm. Respect did for both on both sides, but yeah. But he did clean up the police department. You know, you see all, what you see now uh, about all these police shootings. That was happening in Atlanta in 1970 and 71. There was that, the, my writing. I guess uh, you know maybe 25 percent of all the writing I did at the time was about police shootings. In fact, the Berkeley Barb used to reprint my articles about the police shootings. I don't know, it was a nationwide thing, uh, blacks getting shot at the time. Uh, in fact, we had a 14-year-old girl killed in Capitol homes. She had mental problems, she had a knife, 
and the police are going to tell you, well, she's got a knife. The only thing you can do is shoot her three times? I mean, come on. And so we actually got a warrant hearing in Fulton County. This is how I met Al Horn, the attorney, and Leroy Johnson, who at the time was the highest elected black official in the state, I guess. Or, and so, uh, but at the warrant hearing in Fulton County, they, the judge would not issue a warrant for the officer, but at least they got a hearing. And I went to it, you know, and I wrote about it, exposed it, but, it, but Maynard cleaned it up and it was really easy to do. You know, you stop hiring all these white former Klansmen as cops. Uh, you know, I think the problem is that people don't realize these cops are actually afraid of black men. Uh, and that's still true today. They're afraid of them. So if you're afraid of somebody and you've got a gun, what's the first thing you're going to do to protect yourself? You're going to use that gun. And I, I don't know that it makes, you know, it, it does make a difference that you're racist, but the, the thing about it is a cop's got a gun and he thinks this black person will hurt him. So I've got to hurt him first. And I think that, and that's what was going on. Um, they didn't know how to deal with the black community. So you had all these, you know, white cops. They're going to end up shooting somebody if mm -hmm. they get in confrontation and get. Um, so anyway, Maynard cleaned it up. You know, he got rid of the police chief, who'd been a former Klansman himself, John Inman. And, uh, you know, they hired a lot of black policemen and a lot of people who lived in the city. You didn't have to live in the city to be a policeman, but that certainly helped. And he made that a policy. So Atlanta put those issues to bed, you know, 40 years ago. He didn't, and Maynard Jackson did that. So. And you, you mentioned your roles writing and as managing editor a couple of times. Even when you were managing editor, were you still? Yeah, I was still writing because when I was managing editor, they were focusing more on local news than they were anything else. In other words, the Grace Circle Bird had, you know, set itself up, you know, nationally and as far as the anti-war movement and uh, civil rights movement, they covered those nationally. But uh, by the time I was writing, we were more into local issues and news. And so, you, so you start start writing and being involved in the Bird in in around seventy. Mm -hmm. um, how how long? Were you involved? From probably until, uh, I, I don't know, late 73 probably, maybe early 74. So. Can you talk, you, you just mentioned the sort of what the bird's known for and starts out doing anti-war civil rights. Um, and music, they did a lot of music stuff. I don't know. Uh, and women's, they were in the women's issues too, very heavily. So, mm -hmm. But yeah. but there's move, or maybe maybe moves the wrong word, but uh, at some point a focus it seems to, uh, or a reorientation to include local news. Um, well, like I said, there was a lot of local issues, like like the mayor's race and school desegregation. <laughs> And I may have written down, if I could, some yeah, others. I, I just, um, oh, the police shootings. The, there was a whole bunch of police issues, but the main one was that we just had a rash, I mean, rash of uh, questionable shootings of usually black males, but then there's the one black female who was 14 years old. Uh, there was issues about civil rights and public housing. Um, so that's... And labor, I... not many labor issues in Atlanta. You know, the unions are really weak uh, in Atlanta. I came from a union town. Mobile's a union town. There was, I, I don't know that. I mean, there was some labor uh, people trying to make inroads here, uh, but there, but there was really no labor issues, to, hardly any. Mm. And again, I'm from a labor town, you know, and and I was a union member, uh, but here. And I don't think much has changed. Mm. But uh, as I remember some black, some unions did try to make a push here, but not much in the South. Mm. Mostly just the civil rights uh, issues. 
so in your your years at the bird um how would you reflect on the development of the paper or evolution of the paper um in many respects like i know that it it moves locations yeah. that there are there's the rotating rotations of of managing editors and then there are also you know people coming in and out of the paper um, yeah I, mean, all that I, I don't know what to say i mean yeah it was always changing there's always different people um people like the coffin sort of stepped into the background during my um during the time I was there. Um, there was a whole big arguments back then about uh, gay issues, because people could not agree on that. So there was a real friction around the bird about those issues, gay issues. Um, and I, uh, I tried to stay out of it, of course, but then when you do that, you usually make things worse. <laughs> so there was a lot of, of argument and meetings uh, uh, that was a big issue at the time, how to deal with that uh, for the paper. That was a very difficult issue that probably never gets resolved, you know, never got resolved. And what, what do you think was the, the crux of the uh, I think, argument? you know, it was just, I think it, it, it's, instead of the issues, it got down to personalities and the, the, uh, it was a question of control over the bird, you know, at one time they felt like the gays had taken over the bird and then so the old guard did not like that and you know then they the old guard sort of moves back in and things like that were going on mm. you know, that probably people probably don't talk about that much but to me that was the main issue at the time they could never resolve that never got resolved to any to to everybody's satisfaction it never got resolved And were there sort of irreconcilable falling outs because of yes, this? Yes, that's what I took. I think there was a lot mm -hmm. of irreconcilable falling out. Yeah, so. yeah, because I've been doing a fair number of these these interviews now, mm -hmm. and um, oh, so it has come up. Okay, the, I tried to stay out of, but like I say, that that was the worst thing to do, and it didn't work, and I did get caught up in the middle, and you know. And what, what became of that when you... Well, my recollection, again, my recollection was the old guard moved back in and took over the bird, and I insisted that we needed input because some of the most talented people uh, were gay. Now, that may not be the way to look at it, but that's the way I sold it. And so when I was managing editor, I said, you know, I'm going to keep... These people are going to write. They're going to contribute. And so our, later on that blew up in my face because some of those people did some things that uh, were not helpful. And uh, so, you know, I guess I, but you know, things worked out, I mean, you know, but uh, I think that basically in the end, as I remember, the gay faction sort of felt like they'd been pushed out mm. about 19, late 73 or 74. Not all, but, but a lot of them felt like that. Do you know what they what these writers ended up doing at that? No, I, I didn't keep up with them. In, you know. I mean, you, you know, to us the problem was that they focused only on their issues, and like you know, they didn't focus on weren't so interested in the anti-war stuff or the civil rights, their their own civil rights, but not black civil rights so much. And so, you know, there's that, you, you only have a certain amount of resources, the Gray Circle Bird, you know. Uh, you know, they live in what, finances were week to week. Nobody's got a checkbook to help the Gray Circle Bird. It was a week to week operation mm. with advertising and paper sales. So. Do you recall there being pushback from these these gays writers or the gay community groups, at this point, the Gay Liberation Front would have been active. I don't remember the names of the groups, you know. I just remember the people. And like I say, my my thought was it seemed like they 
basically he took over in 72 or 73. He was predominantly gay, and then there was a pushback from the old guard, uh, late 73, maybe early 74. And at that point, uh, we did lose a lot of gay uh, contributors. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it, it didn't change. It wasn't an anti-gay. It's a question of resources. What are we going to focus and cover, uh, and how are we going to do it? And so, you know, like I say, it was never anti-gay, or it was never that kind of thing. It's just a question of focus and resources. So. Mm. Who, who, or what comprised the old guard by that time? Well, I just um, by that time. I mean, I, see, I, I was not again. I was not part of the founding, and uh, so a lot of the founding. People were gone, but you know the people that I knew, as I considered the old guard, were the Coffins, Linda Fibbin, Steve Wise, uh, Lucia Doby. It was she was gone, but you know not much long after I got there. Um, and uh, Linda Fibbin's uh, husband. Um, gosh, who else? Uh, Howard Remains gone, so I didn't even he, he was already gone when I got there, mm -hmm. so I didn't even really know him. Um, you could probably mention, I'm probably leaving out some other founders um, who may have been gone by the time I got there. Uh, but that's, I guess, I'm sure I'm leaving people out, but that's the ones I think of off the top of my head. And who were your, who did you have closest relationships with? Uh, you know, and my problem was I was not good at uh, relationships, so I was not close to anybody. Except, you know, I think, you know, you could probably say uh, Steve Wise. Uh, there was a guy in there named Lyndon who was, uh, he, I always liked him because he was talented. You couldn't get, you couldn't get a lot of uh, product out of him, but he was very talented and very articulate. I, was, I liked him. Um, but, uh, you know, there were several photographers who, you know, since I was in local news, I worked with them. Uh, Jenkins and um, there's another guy, but I don't remember his name. But no, I was I was younger than everybody. I was they were all at least five years older than me. I was a little, a little bit young, uh, so there was not a lot of social uh, interaction. Mm. I was a farm boy from Kentucky. You know, so. I didn't do drugs, so I wasn't, you know. <laughs> What was the the sort of role or uh, scene of drugs with the birds? You know, I didn't notice it that much. They were not really druggies. Uh, I know they all, you know, smoked marijuana and I'm sure did other things, but I was not part of that. Um, you know, it, 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 I didn't ever see that drugs ever affected anybody who was actually working there or um, or affect the operations of the paper um, but again number one I didn't socialize or party with them and um, so you know I mean there was people around you know that usually you know people had had like been through rehab or you but people had serious drug problems you didn't see a lot of that mm -hmm. Did you have a have a social life outside of the bird? A little bit, a little bit. Is there a way to to characterize that that it was around a certain neighborhood or group of people no. activity? No, just just who you made friends with. Yeah. During your time at the bird, did was there a vision or sort of aspiration that you were pushing towards of what you wanted the paper to to be or what you wanted it to do in the city, the South? I think I got uh, uh, just tied up in the local news aspect, um, and um, probably you know overemphasized those issues. That's that's what I was interested in. Um, um, so. 
And with that, the your interest in local news and your comment of that the that the Atlanta Journal Constitution was not very reputable or <laughs> not very reliable. They would not cover anything negative. They sh- didn't cover a lot of the r- racial and uh, issues that were cropping up, the police shooting issues. They just didn't cover them. It's not that they would cover them badly or lie about them. They just, like, they don't exist. If it's a problem that's going to make our city look bad, well, it doesn't exist. If we don't cover it, who outside the city knows about it nationally? That was their attitude, mm. you know. And we fought that, you know, and, and the Grace Huckle Bird fought that image they were trying to portray for Atlanta. And was that a primary motivation for you with your coverage right, to, right. to get that? Yeah. Yeah. And in your the role as managing ever editor, that's a, a staff position. That's a paid position, is it? Yeah, it's uh, but it doesn't pay any more than the rest of them. I think that what the salary at the time, like forty dollars a week or something. Yeah, I did. Yeah, and even something. if you're managing editor, it's forty dollars a week. Yeah, it was not a change. It may have gone up to sixty one time, and then probably went back down to forty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's yeah. I think that's what it was. And what was the? What were the actual responsibilities and tasks? Where well, you've got to make the decisions of. You know what's going, what is going in the bird, what stories, reviews, whatever. You know, there's other people around, but you've got, and then uh, what's on the front page? On the front page, you know, what are you going to put on the front page? You know, so those were the main duties of being managing editor, and then of course trying to work with the different people during the week about what stories they're working on. You have a national editor who's work, who's just you know getting in national stories. You know, there was a, there was. A, couple of news, uh, um, what do you call it, news um, providers or news services nationally for the left press, and we, we had those, we paid for some of those, and so we'd have to, see the national editor, I'll have to work if we decide what to use, what, to, what we're gonna print, because you got limited space, or whether that's worthy of the cover, you know. A lot of, you know, anti-war issues of course were, and of course Nixon was worth a lot of covers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. And did you have to, as managing editor, were you also working with like the advertising editor and? Not so much, uh, but the managing editor, I think that everything was decided it was a cooperative. You know, you would take your decisions, there was an editorial meeting and I think everybody who's on the staff then votes or tries to come to consensus about what's on the cover and if we have to cut something a consensus about what to cut which means you know you're making a decision about what to put in but basically you're deciding you know what has to be cut Um, then you have the layout people you have to sort of they were the best people because that was hard work laying out the paper in those days and making the right decisions in the layout and so uh, that had to you know you had to look over that a little bit who who at the time was sort of on the the layout team? You know, as I remember, and I keep saying Steve Wise, Steve Wise to me was, when I was there, had the, a lot of influence because he was willing to do the work. And he was doing layout, supervising layout, plus he was probably music editor, national editor, he was all these different things. Again, by the, like I say, by the time I got there, Stephanie Coffin and Tom Coffin had sort of stepped back. Mm-hmm. Um, Stephanie was around more than Tom when I was there. Um, so. You mentioned these editorial meetings, and then there, if I recall, there are also weekly collective meetings. Right. Um, can you speak a bit about what you remember about those? Just that people genuinely try to talk things out, work things out, agree on things, talk about political things that other people may have questions or needed education on. And, you know, it was generally very, uh, very uh, informative, very 
uh, sometimes even intellectual, was very, very, very good. And like how long would these meetings um, typically? An editorial meeting, uh, you know, I would guess the minimum would be two hours. And this is like on a It would evening. be on a weeknight, you know, probably a Monday or Tuesday. I think you're trying to have the bird ready by, what, Tuesday at noon or something? Maybe Wednesday morning for the printer? Something like that. It, it, it changed, and it depended on things, but basically on Monday you're put together a paper. You know, people coming in on Monday night doing the layout and then saving space for the things that are kind of be coming in late, things like that. So it's probably Monday night, Tuesday night. One of those for a meeting. But you know, like I say, during the week you you have those same discussions, you know, hey, I think I'm going to do this, what do you think? You know, you'd be asking people all the time, I think I'm going to do this, I think, you know. Just for instance, you know, how think you know, individuals don't control so much. One time, <laughs> since I was a local ed- editor, whatever, they just said I need to do a story about Billy Graham coming to Atlanta for the crusade. And so, I told him, I said, you know, I am not qualified, you know, for that. And I said, but there's nobody else to do it. You got to do it, Mike. So he was coming on to these week-long crusades. And so Jim was decided I would go to the first night and write it up and so they could have a bird out before he left town. And so, and so I'm going, you know, I, I, I attend, I write it. And I do, I take it around to everybody. I said, this is shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. Come on, guys. You gotta. If you want me to do this, I gotta have help. And so, yeah, I'm just crying and whining. And uh, you know, lo and behold, at the end, people liked it. Now, I did get input, and you know, but people, for some reason, liked that. I mean, I, I put it to Billy Graham pretty good, and I, you know, I attended and went down there. So, but you know, that's how things work and got done. I guess the best example I can think of. Mm. Normally, I wouldn't share my writing or freely offer somebody, hey, edit this or give me my ideas, you know. <laughs> so. Your approach m- more was to sort of write your, yeah, your you just write it to local and news. And 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 I, would get, I would get a lot of after criticism. I would say I wasn't political enough. I should have, uh, you know, you wanted me to beat people over the head and, and uh, you know, about when it came to politics, that uh, I did not include enough, uh, you know, actual political verbiage and things in my local news stuff. So. And what were the the politics amongst the collective? Um, uh, you know, like I mean, clearly I, left, but <laughs> re, you know, you had you. There was a split. We actually had, you know, we had some of the communist. There's several communist parties. I didn't go into that at all. There were several communist parties in Atlanta, and they all had a toehold except the Socialist Workers Party and the Bird. And they had some person assigned to work, actually do work, so they have an influence, so we couldn't kick them out. So they all had a little influence, not much, but they were there, and they were good people. I don't want to disparage them. Uh, so you had the people who really believed in overthrowing, uh, you know, the government. This is, this is, you know, 68, 69, 70, 71. There's still all those people around, you know, we need to overthrow, we need a revolution. And uh, then you had people who were just, you know, liberal. And so, you know, that was a, a strange mix. Uh, uh, you know, as, as time went on, you know, the communists, the people who wanted to actually overthrow, you know, they their numbers went down and that whole thing, you know, people saw that was not going to happen in this country. There's not going to be a communist revolution. But we had that influence and we had those issues, um, you know. As I always told them, I said, you know, Marx is addressing the Industrial Revolution. And, you know, he's probably right. But we're not in the Industrial Revolution. That happened a hundred years ago. <laughs> and so that was my argument, you know, that, uh, you know, y- 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 there's not got, in other words, I wasn't disagreeing with them. In, in fact, uh, 
you know, Marx was right about uh, capitalism, but or the industrial revolution, and and uh, but that's not the that's not the society we're living in now, and uh, people are not gonna you know rise up and you know that was my take. It's not gonna be a revolution, and that you know, I'm sorry to have to tell you these guys, but <laughs> so that never went over well. But that was my take anyway. Do you recall which? You had the October League. Yeah. You had the uh, Socialist Workers Party, who was probably the strongest, but they had done so many backhanded things with the bird people that they were all sick of them. Uh, you know, trying to you know, wield influence and get stories in the paper. Uh, but we had the October League, the Socialist Workers Party. You know, the the at the time there was the U.S. Communist Party, and that was a joke to everybody. You know. Mm -hmm. that, they didn't have a, I don't think they had an Atlanta chapter. They may have, but if they did, they didn't bother us. Um, there was the National Communist Daily that still came out at the time. Um, but they never had a lot of, of influence. Um, so. there, I can't remember any other actual Communist Party offshoot except the uh, the National Communist Party, the October League, and the Socialist Workers Party. Mm -hmm. There's probably somebody else I'm forgetting about. Were there other Atlanta organizations that sort of had representation or a, uh, a hand you know, at, I a seat developed at the table? a relationship with uh, Jose Williams, who was one of the you know original people in the Southern Christian Leadership Council who was one of the lieutenants of Martin Luther King. For whatever reason, uh, we developed a relationship. And later on, I, again, I worked for him after the birth in 74. I worked on the publications for SCLC. Um, and so we kept, and that was a time of, there was all this turmoil in the black civil rights organizations, of course, after King died. Who was going to take over? Who was going to take the mantle? Who's, you know, leadership? Uh, that, you know, hasn't been resolved to this day. <laughs> you know, when, when they shot King, I mean, that was just such a blow, irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. And time has, has proved that true. He was, it was an irreplaceable blow that crippled uh, the civil rights movement. I mean, people like John Lewis and, and uh, uh, Andy Young and Jose Williams carried on, but they sort of each sort of went their own way and the centralness of the national movement uh, died with uh, Martin Luther King. How, how did you meet Jose? I, you know, I, I'm not sure. He was involved, anything in Atlanta that's going on, if there's a civil rights demonstration or something, Jose is in on it. And he, you know, his, his uh, one uh, flaw was he, he had to control too much, so he's on top of everything, but he's also trying to control it. So he's going to be talking to you if you're writing about it in the Great Circle Bird. He's going to want to talk to you, tell you what he's doing, tell you what's going on, and so we we developed a relationship from that. You know, um, so. but he was the rabble rouser, and that's what Martin Luther King used him for. He was great at getting a crowd going. He could. He could get a, a crowd stirred up, and he was so good at it. Mm -hmm. Give that man a bullhorn, and you know, you have to send somebody a speaker in and af afterwards to calm the crowd down to keep them from rioting once you turned it over to Jose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and were, were you also a full time student while you were doing? Uh, you know, on and off. I just kept in and out of school. Um, you know, I, I'm one of the few people that, that got a law degree first and a Bachelor of Arts from Georgia State second. So I don't think I graduated till uh, I got a law degree in 1978 and then graduated after that from Georgia State. I just kept going back and forth. You know, when I was at the Bird, uh, after the first year or so at Georgia State, I think I dropped out again. I uh, didn't have enough money on a Bird salary to go to college. I didn't ever borrow money. And you know, again, I supported myself from you know early on, so I never. But uh, again, I, from the SCLC, um, I started work. Uh, uh, the 
president of the George ACLU was Al Horn at the time, our past president. He was an attorney. He did a lot of the, the drug, uh, drug work, legal work, representing criminal defendants and drug work. And, you know, one time, you know, I had dealings with him. I had dealings with him with a 14-year-old who got shot by the police because mm -hmm. he was the attorney for the family or something. And so I met him because I wrote the article. That's how it came to his attention. And so, he, you know, one day he says, you know, I'm tired of hiring all these Emory students who can't write. He uses them as law clerks. He says, you can write. Why don't you come work for me for a while? And, of course, he could pay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I said, as long as, you, as long as I don't have to law, go to law school, I'll do it. And, you know, so we made an agreement. Of course, in six months, I was in law school. <laughs> and and what, that's how I went to law school. What year would that have been when you started? I probably it? started in 75 if I graduated in 78, three years. Yeah, because I, yeah, 78 when I've been practicing law since 1978. Okay. So. And where, and did you go to law school at Georgia State? No, no. Georgia State Law School did not start till 1985. Okay. So I went to Atlanta Law School. Okay. And you could begin law school at that time? You didn't need a college degree. I think the requirement was actually, there may have been a requirement of two years of college. Mm. Now, now it's different, but back then I think it may have been a two-year college requirement. And that would have been all. It could have been less than that, mm -hmm. but I think it was two years. Well, I want to come, come back to that, but uh, first wrap up. Uh, the time at the bird, were you, were you working outside of the bird as well, while you were managing editor? Uh, or? Yeah, I think that uh, a couple of times and during some of that period, I was a paper boy for the Atlanta Journal Constitution. That was the best paying job. That it paid very well, and I had a great area. I had Georgia Tech, uh, Midtown, around 10th Street offices. I had Colony Square. I was the first paper boy for when Colony Square opened. And I had Ansley Park. Mm. So I made a lot of money off that. I think that's what I was doing when I first started working for the bird. I think that's what I was doing. It, it paid well, so that's what I did. And I was doing it in the morning. I did not have afternoon round, none of that. Morning is what I, I delivered the morning papers seven days a week and had a gigantic paper route that I inherited from somebody else who had put it together. Back then they were independent contractors and got paid directly by the customers, not by the paper. It was a whole different system. Okay. And you made a lot of money. So that's what I did for money. Yeah, good. That's good. how I supported myself. And it was at night, so it didn't interfere with anything else, you know. From four to seven in the morning, you're not interfering with anything else. And for how long do you think that you did that? I did on and off from when I got here until um, 75 at least. And then I think I started doing it again for a while while I was in law school. Wow. I, I did it right before. I bought my first house in 1976 and I did it for extra money so I could buy that house. So I was probably doing it 70, part of 75 and 76. Did you move around a lot in, in between 70 and 76? Or did you? you I went to, you, um, I was in Home Park and then Candler Park. Probably two different places in Candler Park. I think I, somebody bought the house I originally was living in in Candler Park renting and then kicked me out. <laughs> Gentrification. So I just moved down the block on McClendon. And, um, I don't, I'm, I don't remember exactly where I moved before. I bought my first house right over by Agnes Scott in unincorporated Decatur, but near Decatur, near Agnes Scott mm -hmm. in 76. And so started working for the Law Project, Al Horn. I started working for Al Horn in 75, the Law Project in 76. He was part of the Law Project. So we both moved, so to speak, from private practice to the law project. Did any did any other bird people work with Al in the the law project at that time? Yes, yeah, Stephanie came Stephanie was with us later. She was not she was in the original group, I think, but she didn't come to work till later. Mm. She was in the formative group for the law project, Stephanie was. 
Uh, bird people. I think Roger Friedman. Yeah, I was going to say time, was Roger there. He he wasn't there in the beginning, but I think at one time he did work for the Law Project. Roger Friedman, um, Stephanie. Yeah, it could have been other people. I don't remember. And again, I was not in the original group that formed it, but I think I was in the original group that started working there. It was, it was already, uh, people were already, you know, forming it, trying to get together, but uh, the day one of operation, I think I was there. Mm -hmm. But I was not part of the planning group. I think that's it's close to the truth. I may have been part of the late planning group because I was already working for Horn. So sometime they brought me in on the planning group for the Law Project. And what, what is the Law Project? The Law Project was supposed purpose? to be just a cooperative law office. Attorneys and legal workers, supposedly equals, you know, how well that worked out. Mm. And uh, doing, you know, community work. We did try to represent civil rights uh, issues and uh, criminal defendants. Um, and there was a lot of civil rights lawsuits, of course, at the time. So that's... And can you <clears throat> can you talk some about about Al and who he was? What uh, you know, he's one of those. We're not going to be able to. Al's talk one of to those him. larger than life people who was you know uh, active in the ACLU, but very good criminal lawyer. He was a bearded, old bearded white guy from Alabama who was as liberal as and radical as they come, and uh, you know he fought. Uh, the uh, drug laws uh, was his primary aim to soften up the drug laws and um, but and, 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 and work on civil rights issues represent demonstrators who got in criminal trouble do some civil rights issue lawsuits um, and how long how long did you work with him I I worked with them uh, until I, I stayed, six months after I got out of law school, I think I left the law project, something like that. I stayed there six months after I got out of law school, I did a little law practice with the law project and I just went out on my own. Mm -hmm. And did you work with Reber, Reber Bolt as well? Yeah, I worked with Reber Bolt and at Reber, yeah, yeah. We had Reber Bolt, uh, Jim Jenkins, uh, Bensonetta Lane and Amy Tottenberg came a little later. They weren't the original people, but Judge Lane, of course, Fulton County Superior Court, and Amy Tottenberg's on uh, federal judge now, mm -hmm. United States District Court. Um, they came later. And Charles Thornton, um, was he, he was not an original member either, though. He came later. Good criminal lawyer in Atlanta. I think I've named all the original lawyers. I think of the original lawyers were Al Horn, Reber Boat. Maybe Mary Joyce Johnson, well, she could have been an original. Um, Jim Jenkins was the original lawyer. That may have been the four lawyers. Again, when it's formed in 76, I'm in law school. Mm -hmm. Don't become a lawyer to 78. And where, where were your offices? They were right downtown at Five Points. There was, um, I forgot what the building is called. It's gone now. It was a, it was a, an office, uh, Suites that had the parking lot right next to a part of it. <laughs> you could drive up the parking deck and you know be a, a couple of feet from your office. Um, it's right there at Five Points, right by the park where the um, Central City Park is now. Okay. It was mm -hmm. right there in that corner of Marietta and Peachtree. Hmm. That was the where their office was. And later on, we moved over to the, um, um, what building is that, um, famous building. It's right across from the U.S. Courthouse on Forsyth. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of yeah. it. So we, we moved later on. And you would have been active at the um, at the bird in seventy two when it's firebombed. You know, I had taken off 
and uh, was working some job. I, th- I think uh, when the actual fire bombing happened, I was not there. Mm. And uh, I had I was just working and probably back in school and working uh, as a uh, in some packaging plant over on Miami Circle in Atlanta, mm-hmm. packaging chemicals for about six months, and then I went back to the bird. How did that that event affect the bird? Like particularly since you weren't there when it actually happened, did you notice anything? I had heard about it and people let me know that they thought it was because of all the anti-mayor stuff about myself and the anti-police stuff we were doing. That's what people just assumed it was about. Because uh, we, uh, you know, we covered all those police shootings and, you know, got the reports, looked at them and, you know, said, you know, this is what happened. And, and we had a lot of threats and stuff about that, uh, but I, you know, I, I don't know what else to tell you, but we were pretty sure that's what it was about. Was there sort of in the tenor of the the organization or the way it operated, was there anything different from before the bombing to after the bombing? I couldn't you... speak to that because I was not there at the actual time it was bombing. And, of course, I think it was bombed. Didn't they move? Mm-hmm. And I was not in on that move. I came back right after that move. So. Do you, do you know anything, um, like, physically what was lost as a result of the bombing? Not really, not really. Yeah, I was just curious about that. I don't think I've asked anybody anybody else of like what sort of records or um, yeah, just ephemera, things, that part of the office that might have, might have been lost as a result of that. Um, do you recall any Anything about the um, the neighbors of the bird, the bird houses, while you were involved, uh, were they residential neighbors? Yes, it was and, all residential. It was right there, uh, two offices that I can remember. One of them's right there near Andley Mall, and the other is is right there on Piedmont, I guess, uh, surrounded by. Again, those houses. About half of them were gentrified at that time. They were, like I said, I lived in a rooming house right there, the, the last office of the bird or the one on Piedmont. And, um, you know, so there wasn't, I don't remember any big neighborhood issues coming up. We were all behaved. I don't know that anybody would complain about us. I don't, I'm not, I don't remember anything. Yeah, not even necessarily whether there were complaints of just, mm-hmm. like, who were the neighbors? Like, mm-hmm. what were they... Families or no, like retirees I said, basically they, kids. they turned all that property into rental properties, you know, mm-hmm. rooming houses, things like that. I mean, now they've been reclaimed and they're single family houses again, but at that time, I would say, um, I would think that less than half of them were actually single family houses. So, quite likely, kids in the hip scene. Uh, yeah, kids in the hip scene and then older working men who were single. Mm-hmm. And were you were you primarily living living singly during these years? Did you have roommates? I think when I first started working with the bird, I had two roommates over. I forgot I, one place I lived was in. Um, Midtown near near Piedmont Park. I did live there and had two roommates. Mm-hmm. I don't know how long I lived there, at least a year, but that was during my bird period. It was a regular apartment with two bedrooms. And in fact, a, a roommate moved out that had originally sublet from. He moved in, so then two people at the bird moved in. And one of them was a student at Georgia State, and the other was a bird worker, I think. Or maybe he was a student and then started working at the bird a little bit. Who were they? I don't remember their names. Oh, yeah. 
Nice people, good people. Right. Got that. And during this time, were you involved in any other sort of activist sort of things or political? No, my, my second priority was schooling. First priority was the bird, and so that was my emphasis. If I got some extra time, I was going to go back to school. Mm -hmm. I did that for years, you know, work a little, go back to school, do both, you know. Mm -hmm. Did you do anything that, you know, was your outlet for just pure enjoyment, things that you... Something music. I think or after film I, or? no, after I bought my first house, that was seventy six. I got back into being physically fit. So my, um, you know, I, into this day, you know, I, I exercise all the time. You know, mm -hmm. all those people that's just an addict. You know, if I can, if I can hold it to twice a day, I, you know, that's a, you know, I'm going to exercise. And I used to play a lot of basketball. I used to run a lot, um, play soccer. Yeah. Through an organized league or more? No, I, well, leagues. I was in leagues. I was in a couple of lawyers' leagues. But then I started playing with a group of guys who played for you know at least fifteen years. Played at six o'clock in the morning uh, at the old Buckhead Y, and then when they tore that down, we moved to that church. Affiliated uh, uh, gym uh, uh, in Buckhead, uh, second uh, second Ponce de Leon Avenue Church. We moved there, and then when they re re built a new Y, we didn't. We stayed at the church gym for years. I didn't quit playing until um, twenty thirteen or something. Full court basketball. I finally gave it up. I didn't want to have a knee replacement surgery in my old age, so. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know. But no, I didn't, and, uh, and I played in a couple of basketball, and I played softball a lot when I was younger, but I gave that up oh, a long time ago, 1990 or so, I think. Mm -hmm. But, and the reason I quit doing that is because for all the effort you put into it, uh, you didn't get that much exercise out of it. Plus, I was, the leader of the team. I was a team manager, organizer, um, uh, uh, and, and footing the bill for it for a group of, uh, we were in, in the softball leagues in the city. You know, I think we had it one good year, and I said, oh, we had it. Let's, let's quit. <laughs> did you do much bicycling? I did early on. I gave that up when I got married, and that would have been 1994. I would go twice a week usually 40 to 60 miles down in Rockdale and Newton counties, south to Cab, or just ride twice a week, 40 to 60 miles. Wow. Were you riding in the city during your time at the Bird? No, I did not ride a bicycle back and forth to the Bird, I don't think. I could have a couple of times. I would have done it a couple of times, but I'd, you know, if you want to live long, you don't do a lot of riding on that city streets, at least back then you did. Yeah, I just recall that there was a a series probably in 70, between 71 and 73 in the Burn about bicycling in the city. I think it was by, written by D. Railer. Yeah, and I've met D. Railer. He's a real person. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, again, you know, they were trying to get bike paths and yeah, and they had s yeah. Sunday rides through the yeah. city. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't do that. I was a soul. I, I went along. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Anti-social. Hey, if it works for you. <clears throat> Is there anything else particularly about the bird years that you, that we didn't touch on? I guess that we did, um, the only one thing I could say is, is because I made it up to myself, we did a lot of coverage of the public housing and its problems and the, what do you call it, the um, urban renewal. Urban renewal was a big issue and this is something that should be said and we covered that. I mean they literally stowed land from people who lived in the inner city. People don't realize it, but 
40% of this in-city land, including Bedford Pines areas, that was actually owned by black people. We're talking about poor black people who owned their own homes. Now again, there was a lot of slums and bad housing on landlords and slumlords, but about 40%, and you know, I did the statistical work, so I remember, was actually people owned it, and they just stowed that land from these people. And of course, they built public housing. Now, those people, nobody wanted public housing, but that was what they, that's what you get. We're gonna take your land, give you public housing. And so that's how all the public housing in Atlanta got built. And of course, as you know, in the last 10 years, they've torn it all down. So they promised them the public housing, took their land, you know, let them have it for 30 years, and then took that away from them. You know, they didn't ask for the public housing, but that's what they got. And now they've taken that. So mm -hmm. that was a big issue then. It's not a big issue now because nobody cares. But you see that Leon Eplin, who was the, the master architect of that plan, was quoted in the paper a couple months ago. He came back to the city to say, and he said that, we stowed the land. And now, you know, we've torn down the public housing. And, of course, he got one story in the newspaper for that. But his name was Leon Eplin, and he was uh, an architect and an actual uh, city planner at one time. And did they steal it through eminent domain? Yes, eminent yeah. domain, they took it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, they kept saying that we've got all these government programs to reimburse them, pay them their moving expenses. Yeah, you go down the street and talk to these people, and none of them ever got that money. Yeah, it was available on the books, but they didn't get it. They stole this land and built this city on stolen land. Mm -hmm. And we covered that issue. And, you know, but it, we didn't have much of an impact. In fact, in 1990, I, um, I was in the master's program here at Georgia State in criminology. And so I, had, I did a paper for some class uh, about how now they were uh, tearing down all the public housing and they wanted to, they wanted to tear down Techwood Homes. That was the first housing project built by Franklin Del Roosevelt. And uh, so I wrote a story about it, saying, you know, it was on the National Historic Register and talked about how it got built. It's not because those people wanted it, you know, that's what they were given. And so it shouldn't be just what Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech wanted the land, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, in downtown. And they'd always wanted it. So Maynard Jackson, and he, if you remember, he was mayor for eight years, and Andy Young was mayor for eight years. Then Maynard Jackson had a third term. Mm -hmm. It was during his third term he stepped in and stopped it. Of course, after he's gone, then they finally tear Techwood Homes down. Mm -hmm. but, so anyway, we, it's an issue that still rubs me the wrong way, you know. So. No, and you guys, with the bird, I, I've been reading the the coverage, and there's. Some particular coverage about the was it East Lake Gardens? Yeah, there was some. Uh, I don't remember. There were some other people doing the East Lake Gardens. I was doing the stories about Techwood Homes and mm -hmm. the urban renewal. I was doing the urban renewal stories. Uh, East Lake was another. You know, it's a mistake. And the people talk about how you know East Lake was a bad place. Okay, it was not a nice place. But those people didn't build that community. The government in the Atlanta power structure had that built so they could get these blacks out of Atlanta, out of the housing and land they wanted to, you know, build all these uh, edifices on, and so they did it. And, you know, they just crammed, you know, thousands. Uh, what was it? At one time, there was at least three thousand people mm -hmm. in those public uh, housing uh, projects at East Lake. So it was a disaster. It was not a good place to live. Raise your children, and they built it for children. You know, this is the one they designed, said, we're going to have it so mothers can have five children and live in here. Oh, what a great idea to pack mothers, a thousand mothers, each with five children in East Lake. That's such a great idea, mm -hmm. you know? So. I live over there now, uh -huh. and over the last decade, they run all that. Yeah, they ran them out, mm -hmm. and it's gone, yeah. They wanted that land back. I guess now we're out to Lithonia or something, yeah. where they're... Well, they're Section 8 now. Place. They don't right. build public housing anymore. They, you know. so. so, 
you said that you left the bird in about 73 or 74? Early 74, I guess, late 73. Yeah. Worked for SCLC for a year and then went to Alhorn. And you were you were writing. I was writing. writing. We had a publication, The Crusader. Mm. The Atlanta People's Crusader was the name of their publication. Came out, I think we got it out almost once a month. And it was my, and I was the managing editor of it. The, the only problem was, I, you know, I loved that work too, but they couldn't pay. I mean, they, they, they just ran out of money, finally, and didn't have any money. And then Al, and again, Al Horn offered me a job, and so mm-hmm. I said, yeah, I got to do it. You know, I don't. Y'all can't pay me. You know, there's, you know, as, as time went on, there's less and less money for the civil rights movement. Yeah. So, you know. And what what were you doing? Same issues, without? covering local issues. That's what SCS, SCLC wanted to cover locally. They wanted to. Uh, there were so many things going on in Atlanta, the school desegregation issue, the police shooting issues. Uh, there was a lot of issues they wanted to uh, work on. And so I fit right in. And with Al, what were you working on? I was like a, a law clerk investigator, you know, legal clerk investigator for Al Horn. Writing briefs. He did a lot of briefs, which he didn't want to, you know, he would. He was a very good editor, but he didn't want to have to do the, you know, research and writing part mm-hmm. and I fit right in I, I picked right up even though I had no legal training at the time you know it, it wasn't you know. and you said that within six months of starting for Al you were at law school I was in law school <laughs> and were you doing those things concurrently you were still yeah, working for him I was night, yeah night law school yeah I went at night yeah wow that was probably an intense couple of years well, when I started working at, I mean, when I started at the University of Louisville, I was working the night shift at General Electric, so. You know. so. Did you go into to law school with a with an idea of, this is what I want to do with the degree? No, I never wanted to do it. I never wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, I, I probably hated it. And you know, the saving grace for me was when I, I got married and had kids. You know, that could become my primary focus. Practicing law, if I could make money on it, then you know, it didn't bother me as much. But yeah, I'm, I, I wasted my talents and my life practicing law. That was not what I should have done. So anyway, there you go. What should you have done? I should have stuck to writing. I actually have a talent, and, but you know, I didn't, so. And what, what was your law? Your legal work, I, I think. I still do criminal and a lot of civil. I did a lot of civil rights for a while. You know, suing police for wrongful death and civil rights violations and things like that. I, Exclusively or primarily in the state of Georgia? Yeah, Atlanta. right in the in the Atlanta area. Yeah, well, actually, I practiced in the Southern District of Georgia, the Middle District of Georgia, but mostly Atlanta area. And that's what you've done yeah, all these years. Yeah, that's what I've done all these years. <clears throat> As a sole practitioner, mainly. I guess that makes what, forty years? Yeah, it'll be forty years this year, sometime. And in those years, <clears throat> did your your work and your uh, exercise compulsion take up the majority of your time, or did you ever? Uh, get back involved with writing for something or uh, some cause or issue that stirred no, you? No, I never, except I did in the Make the Exception in 1990. I, I think I didn't finish my story about the 1990 wrote the article about Techwood Homes and I got the, one of the local black papers to print it and then Maynard Jackson stepped in and I, they did publish that. It was the, the Atlanta Daily World and the, um, what's the other Weekly, the weekly published my paper that I had done on the Georgia Tech uh, public housing mm. in 1990. That's probably the only year. I wrote, all, I wrote a lot of legal briefs. Right. So. Were you were you aware or involved at all when the 
there was the resurrection of the bird and no i was at the law project uh what year was that 76 no this was 84 85 oh 84 85 no uh, no i was in private practice i was in decatur at the time i, I didn't have anything to do with the rebirth I was out of contact with those people, so I, I didn't have anything. So you bought your first house in 76 over mm -hmm. in Decatur. How long did you stay? Stayed there until 82, bought another house. In 85, I bought a, a log home in right outside Decatur near Agnes Scott on a couple acres. A couple acres? Yeah, it was 2.3 2 acres over there, or three something, two and a half acres. And a log house. Uh, not a kit, especially, but I bought it though from the people who started it who couldn't, who didn't finish it and were too old to continue it, so I, I bought it from them. What, what street was that off? Uh, Tom's Road. Okay. And lived there for 15 years, and then I got married and my wife got pregnant and we decided we'd move to North Fulton because of the school system. Mm -hmm. So I've lived in Roswell since, uh, 1999, but other than a log cabin from 85, 1985 to 1999, had a good garden there that I built. Went back to being a farmer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what sort of things did you did you grow? I had a vegetable garden. I built a raised bed, very big uh, vegetable garden. God, it was huge. It was at least 2,500 square feet. Raised bed, fenced in. Do you still do any gardening? No, I have no sunlight. Uh, when I moved to Roswell, the house I bought was wooded a lot, three quarters of an acre, but it's all woods and trees, and so there's no sunlight. Mm -hmm. So there's no gardening. You're welcome to come over to my house. And <laughs> I put in, put in a bed every year. So you mentioned by the time 84, 85 rolled around, um, that you were largely out of touch with, with the bird folks? Well, you know, I guess... Just, just... I had a terrible setback in 1983. I got real sick. I had what's called uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. What they say, people either get it for six months or get it for life. Well, I had it for eight months and lost every muscle tissue in my body. I couldn't even walk across the street. So I, you know, I hit out. There was a period of that, me hitting out and then, then recuperating. So I lost touch with everything. Um, somehow got by financially because I was still supporting myself. And so, uh, but again, I got over it. Luckily, yeah. Uh, yeah, I lost most of the hair in my head. Um, and at the time, they didn't have any diagnosis for it or, you know, it was one of those like, well, it must be stress. That's what you're told. Later on, you find out where you had chronic fatigue syndrome. And any one of the person who had it, and she actually died. Now, she hung on for several years. Uh, but again, I had it for eight months, and then slowly came back. So uh, it didn't seem to have any effect on me permanently. Uh, but again, it was at the time, it was, a, you know, like I say, you can't even walk across the street. You lose all muscle tissue. Yeah, that's remarkable. And just rest, essentially. And try to get some legal work done. You know. And waiting it out is waiting. what? Well, he didn't know at that time. He didn't know. Um, uh, now we know that it's something that people either have either for six months or their life. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, I mean, I went to the doctor, but it's all... They were giving me... Um, steroid treatments and they told me and which was a problem because I was not supposed to that was their answer to my skin problems in the 19 I mean, 69 and 70 when I was working at the tobacco plant was to give you lots of steroids and so they told me now later in life you've got to remember to tell doctors you can't have any more steroids because you've already overdone it and of course then I got the chronic fatigue and that was their answer for that too so then they tried to localize the steroid thing like they would give me steroid injections in my head to try to give my hair to grow back and things like that. There was no treatment mm -hmm. except for that. So. 
So again, I had that setback. So after that, right after that, I took a job as a public defender in DeKalb, and I did that for two and a half years, and then went back into private practice. But I had, you know, run myself into the ground in 83, so. Mm-hmm. Could have been 83, 84, or something in that period. I had the chronic fatigue. Did you reestablish contact with with bird bird folks after that? Not so much, I guess. Um, except, no, a lot of parts would have been before that. No, no. Are you in contact with anybody today? No, not really. I guess I just you know I'm not I'm not a, a social person at all. That's a, a fault, and but I'm not so. Um, how did you, how did you meet your, your wife? Uh, she was a lawyer. Uh, I was helping, um, Alden Snead, who was the chief public defender in, uh, Douglas County. I had agreed to help him do some appeals and things. He, he didn't have a big staff and she was an attorney. Uh, she graduated from Emory, went out to Douglas County to work for a small firm and I met her doing work for him. Mm-hmm. He probably introduced us and so that's how and and this has been your, as you described it, a saving saving grace for you, a place to put your energies. Right, right. Because like I said, I was never happy practicing law. So. Right. <clears throat> so at this point in your life, um, you've mentioned that practicing law has been a way to earn a living but hasn't been fulfilling necessarily um, and that writing was very meaningful for you um, what what are some of the the things at this point in your life that that mean the most well I just got one daughter started who started at UGA and next year I'm going to have a daughter who starts at Georgia State it looks like so I'm be trying to get them to college so yeah I guess my daughter's a sophomore now at UGA and is there anything in the local national global current events, politics, that, or things that you, you think well, I mean, for my your wife, daughters? That well, my daughters are very uh, liberal, too, and so that's good. But me and my wife are talking about now. Now that the, her daughters are in college, what we've got to do, we're talking about thinking about helping the Democratic Party in North Fulton. It's such a conservative place. Um, but the kids are not conservative. Mm. You know, all the kids I know, and I know a lot because my daughter, they're not conservative Republican, mm-hmm. <laughs> and even though their parents are, and so we've been thinking about maybe doing something, you know, in that in, in that line, um, and I've also thought about maybe uh, doing some writing, but you know, I, I I would have to say since I've got all this time without doing it, you know, it's unlikely I'll return to that. It's a possibility. Yeah, I'd, I'd hope you. You certainly have a knack. I've looked at some of your mm-hmm. your writing from forty years ago. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I said, I didn't follow up on it. Instead, I practiced a lot. <laughs> yeah, brush it off. It's like riding a bike. One of those <laughs> those things. Um, are there any? Any further experiences or reflections that you'd like to share? And, and about the bird, I don't. Yeah, particularly how you reflect on that that era of time. Um, you know, thirty to forty years later now. Well, we were all grappling with later. the same problem. I think I alluded to it. What are we working toward? You know, we had the people who wanted a revolution, and then we had the liberal people who just wanted to reform and change and you know all that and you know look at what's look at what's happened you know we went through Nixon we thought Nixon would be as bad as it ever was you know 
And we also, at the time, I, I, you know, it's just like things don't things stay the same. Trump, you know, we, you know, when you look at it, you say, you know, the people of the United States, there's a lot of them may be stupid and conservative and reactionary and racist, but they never elect. Did Nixon? <laughs> we said the same thing about Trump, and look what happened. So I lived through Nixon, and Reagan, and the second Bush. The first Bush wasn't so bad. The second Bush, and now Trump. I mean, we didn't work hard enough, you know, at what we were doing, mm -hmm. uh, and I regret that. And I'm one of those people that didn't work hard enough, um, and that's what we get. But I haven't given up. I'm not thrown in the towel. I will continue to oppose those things, and, mm -hmm. I, and I will work harder. I will not give up. Yeah, this is our opportunity yeah. now. So. Well, I sure appreciate you making the time to, to come down here and, and share some of this. Um, Whatever it's worth, not worth much. <laughs> oh, as a as a historian and somebody that's extremely interested in this this time period in the city and the politics, mm -hmm. um, I place a lot of value in it. So I thank you. What happened to um, what's that bird guy who was at Georgia State professor? Cliff Coon. Cliff. Yeah. What happened to him? He died, didn't he? He did. Yeah, I remember he died. That. And I meant, was trying to get to his funeral and something happened. I think one of my daughters had something. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was here at Georgia State yeah. for... I talked to him in 90 and then one other time about something after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he came, mm -hmm. came to Georgia State probably in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. He was one of these people like myself that... It, yeah. But it took a very long time for him to complete his his education, um, and then ended up as a as a full time assistant professor and then associate professor. Yeah, and was working on. He actually trained me on mm. oral history. That was his big thing: oral history and southern southern history. Atlanta with an Atlanta focus. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm glad you didn't ask me, but I didn't graduate from Georgia State till 1990. And then I went into the criminal justice master's program and then never did my thesis or what's the other thing you have to do to get your master's? The dissertation or thesis, which one is it? Your thesis, yeah. I didn't do pass it. Pass your comprehensive exam. They kept rejecting all my ideas and finally I got married and started having kids and didn't finish it. They rejected all my ideas. Yeah, good for you to get get away from it, though. I don't know. I like two of the people when there was two women I was working with. Well, I probably can't remember their names in the criminal justice department. Years. Okay, just to. Who was the head of the Black Caucus? So we're coming back for a minute. Oh, okay. We were no. we were talking after the interview, and uh, it came up that you did have a couple. I did have a couple of side projects over the years. I was on the board and was the attorney for the Complementary Alternative Medical Association, which is called CAMA, which uh, tried to protect and, and, and further the rights of these al alternative medical practitioners, acupuncture, things like that. Um, I think I got into that when I was real sick in 83. Plus, I had, in about 1996, I had lifelong um, um, arthritis, a tennis elbow, and been to doctors and nobody could ever really help, you know, took pills and all that, and did, had two sessions of acupuncture and it cured my tendonitis. So I got interested and went on and I, again, I, for years, I think they finally disbanded about 2005, six, something like that. Uh, the leader ran out of energy and decided she wanted to close the organization, but I did a lot of legal work and uh, was on their board. Uh, and then the, also I was, you know, I was the attorney for uh, Congresswoman McKinney. Yeah, I'm sure that people remember all the trouble she got into. And I represented her in D.C. I was her criminal lawyer when she got 
arrested in D.C. Uh, supposedly for shoving the Capitol Hill policeman. Mm -hmm. That's one of the few, that's one of the many things that got her into trouble. And of course, uh, the grand jury in Washington D.C. refused to indict her. It was a pretty much trumped up charge by the Republicans, just trying to discredit her. But I represented her for years, and I was part of the group that went up with her to Libya to try to keep uh, to stop the Obama. Uh, a Hillary Clinton intervention in Libya because we thought that was a mistake, which of course it's turned out to be a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, but I went over there and very interesting. I, that's when they were bombing. I was actually in a hotel in Tripoli while our country was bombing uh, down Tripoli, including downtown Tripoli. And I was, uh, I think the closest I ever got was probably about a mile to a bomb drop. And I was so close one time that you saw the flash. So that's pretty close, but my, estimate, my own estimate was probably a mile, but you just see the light flash. I mean, it, just the light that comes at you, you know. I mean, I was inside and it came at me. Yeah. Um, but I was there doing the bombing in Libya, and I don't remember when that was, but it's been at least uh, five years. You know, whenever the action in Tripoli mm -hmm. was, we went mm -hmm. over to try to, uh, there were, there were several organizations. One was a French organization trying to stop the uh, intervention. Uh, and so I did that and some other things with uh, Congresswoman McKinney. I was her lawyer for years and years. So, Well, did you guys go over with a particular organization or her as a We former? had a name for our organization, but it's something we put together. And, you know, to tell you the truth, I don't remember now what it was. It was a book that came out and... I did a chapter in the book, but my chapter was a, uh, a timeline. I put together the timeline for what happened in Libya, how we got in there, and so that's what I did for the book. Um, so, um, yeah. We met with people over there, um, you know, we were squirreled into the, it was probably not illegal to go there. We, but to get there was very hard. We had to come in through Tunisia in a car. We flew to Paris, and we flew from Paris to Tunisia, and then we took a car. Um, you know, you see a lot of military action. Uh, but it was fascinating. Uh, it was just unbelievable. The things that you, you are told about these countries, I mean, Libya is a... Uh, just for instance, the people in Tunisia, and I talk with uh, a lot of Tunisians, they view themselves as Europeans because hmm. they're very light colored. It's Africa, Tunisia, Libya. Libya, about a third of the people in Libya are black and the other two thirds are mixed. And if you ever see the old pictures of the Berbers, they're called the Berbers, the people who, like the nomadic peoples of Africa, mm -hmm. they are white. It's, it's surprising when you see the pictures. And those are the people that were causing the problems. The white Berbers caused the problems in Libya because Gaddafi, who was black, could never pacify them, satisfy them. And so they're the ones who were making the trouble and stirring things up. He could not. But anyway, uh, Libya, besides the, you know, the color being different than you would ever have guessed, uh, you just went through miles and miles out in the countryside where Gaddafi is building all these houses you call here, here you would call them McMansions. They're very nice looking, but when you go in, they're very simple abodes. I mean, but they're very nice. They're concrete houses. They had a, a concrete structure, form, and apparatus to build. And they're building thousands of houses everywhere. And that was one of his programs to build houses for the people. And so, you know, yes, Gaddafi was a dictator. Why was he a dictator? Because he, he got a country that was drawn up by white people after World War One, That was not a country, Libya was not a country, to white people after World War One sat down on a map and drew up most of Africa. All these tribes and peoples who'd never been together, who'd never had to govern themselves together, they're put in a country that we made up, that white people made up. And so it was hard to govern. Uh, and there was, you know, wars and tribal fights and disputes, you know, and it looked like Gaddafi was doing the best he could, you know, to rule a country that had all these problems. He, he you know, to call them Libyans is, he was trying to make it a country. I mean, again, I'm not, he did do a lot of bad things and there was a lot of repression, but there was a lot of people stirring up problems and making trouble over there. Um, 
and a lot of oil companies had their hands in there. Libya has the, some of the highest reserves, even though their actual oil production is not great, they've got reserves, which was what the Europeans in the United States are interested in, mm -hmm. and they never never tell you about all that. Uh, but anyway, it was very interesting to go over there and, and see the people because it's just, um, it's not what you think, you know. Like I say, these, especially these North African countries, uh, and uh, the thing that got Gaddafi in the biggest trouble, same thing in the United States, he brought in black Africans to build those houses, workers. Libyans had enough money that they, there was enough oil money to, you know, that a lot of them didn't have to do manual labor. So he brought in these black Africans to do a lot of manual labor, and that created a lot of problems for the residents of Libya. They didn't want those Africans in their country, those black Africans, mm. especially the Berbers, who were largely white. And so, anyway, very interesting. Yeah. Was, was Congresswoman McKinney also involved in, <clears throat> this isn't really the right term, but sort of blockade running around the Israelis? She got Palestine? involved in some of the relief. She was yeah. trying to bring relief to Palestine, I believe. Now, yeah. I was not involved in that, and I don't know about it, but I think that's what it was. Okay. Some of the relief boats trying to bring some medical supplies into mm -hmm. Palestine, mm -hmm. and uh, what's the other place over there that's... Uh, but anyway, that's what she was doing, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you weren't on the boat with her that time? I was not on the boat, no. Well, but I had represented her father, Billy McKinney, um, he knew me from back when he was protesting John Inman, oh. the racist police chief. So I had known and kept up with his family all those years. So. And you represented him? He got in some criminal trouble, through, but it was political criminal trouble, you know. Uh, and I don't remember what it was, but he got arrested and I got him in out the cab and we got that thrown out eventually. But I don't remember exactly what that was because that was... It's not that long ago. It was probably 20 years ago. But he did get in some. But he had a bad temper and uh, being a, a, a black politician did not, did not serve him well. As he always said, uh, uh, he, he had always practiced the politics of confrontation, not mediation. <laughs> Well, again, thank you. I'm glad that okay. we came back to. I forgot about Kim. Get those. Ugh. Mm.